Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming back. So I have a few little housekeeping announcements for uh, today. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is that we take a group photo at 11.30 in the main lobby. So not right here, but the main lobby where the registration desk has been. Uh, we'll take a group photo at 11.30. And we have uh, one of our colleagues is a really good photographer, so she'll be there to help us. That's 11.30. Dinner tonight will be at Beckett's, and it's on your schedule if you've got it, the hard copy. Uh, Beckett's is the restaurant that is very close to the other bridge, not the first bridge where we had dinner at Mahoney's, but the next bridge down on Jackson. That'll be at 6 o'clock. Um, and uh, we have the Backlot Comedy Improv Show that Luke will be starring in. Uh, I don't know if it could be any funnier than some of the stuff that's happened over the last year, but um, it'll be at 9 o'clock at the Backlot Comedy, um, which is on Main Street, uh, a little bit south of Gardena's, for those of you who... So it's between the hotel and church. 424 Rainy. Thank you. Sorry. 424 Rainy. Is the address on here as well? I don't think so. Oh, sorry. I can shout it more times, though. 424 North Main. Okay, um, lunch homework from yesterday. I'm sorry, I have not had time to process the uh, lunch homework. So, uh, if if there, Christina, you had a, did you return the sheet that you wrote on? You you just took it back. Okay, so um, at some point later this morning, I hope to process it a little bit and then give you a summary back, um, either after lunch or right at the end of the lightning lightning talks, of which we will have more. So I guess our board got erased. But lightning talks, please sign up over there. I'll just scrap, uh, scratch something out for lightning talks. Um, don't forget that uh, this afternoon, after Steve's uh, closing keynote, we will have a birds of a feather session in here, as well as sprint planning. So just converge back here, and then uh, gather together, figure out what you'd like to work on for tomorrow, or what you'd like to get together to discuss for those of you who won't be here for the sprints. Um, and I do hope that many of you will stay on for the sprints. Uh, in many ways, they're the things that bring new blood into the Plone community, and, and uh, you can forge really good uh, working relationships with people who are leaders in the community. So I hope you'll stay on for the sprints. And that's all I had for housekeeping. If there are any other announcements that anybody wanted to make, New code they've written <laughs> overnight, because I know you had lots of rest last night. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, it's I, I haven't really been sure how to introduce my long-time long -time friend, Brian Silverman, um, other than to keep telling everybody, hey, hey, he's the guy who hired me when I was really young. Um, it was, uh, the way we met was I was, I was lucky enough to be part of a, high school program for overachieving kids that was meant to keep um, kids in Canada to be entrepreneurs in, in the technology field. So as you can see, it really failed with me because I'm not in Canada anymore. But um, Brian's company, Logo Computer Systems, uh, agreed to be a sponsor for that program. And so they were interviewing people. And I went over and visited. And they, they ended up sponsoring me for the program. And as part of the deal, they had to hire me back for six weeks at the end of the summer. So it was my first experience writing software and getting paid to do it. Um, and that particular project was this really weird prototype 6809 uh, breadboarded computer that was meant to be a very portable computer. This was in 1983. And so um, I was asked to learn the fourth language and to write an interpreter for fourth in 6809 assembler. Um, and because that computer had a serial interface, I actually had to write the code on a Fujitsu 6809 computer. So I don't know if many of you know, but there are computers built around the world and lots of Japanese computers at um, Brian's company. And so I spent six weeks kind of pounding my head against the wall. <laughs> and at the end, he still somehow hired me back for three work terms. So um, that's how crazy he is. So uh, Brian's connections go 
um, to the MIT, um, to MIT where he did his undergrad, and his connections there were at the Media Lab, and he's known so many people that were such important innovators in um, artificial intelligence and education that um, it was mind-boggling to be working there and to hear about some of his stories. Um, he's been, he's definitely one of the brightest, most original thinkers that I've met. Um, every time I sit down with, the, with him for a conversation, I worry that he's going to expose me for being a fraud. <laughs> so um, he's been regaling us with some of his stories, and I hope that uh, you'll find them as entertaining and as eye-opening as I have. So with that, I introduce you to Brian Silverman. Let me make sure this turns on first, actually. Yeah, that's good. So, um, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the conference. I guess you're supposed to start with saying a thing like that. Um, I came from Canada, and one of the things is when you come from Canada and fly into the United States, the immigration folks are at the airport there rather than the airport here. And it's always like going through the U.S. immigration in Montreal is always entertaining. This time, they said, where are you going? I said, Oshkosh. Now, I don't really want to say anything about Oshkosh, but the guy looked at me like, <laughs> Oshkosh, well, why are you going there? I said, to a plum symposium conference. And the, he said, a plum symposium. And I said, it's a content management system for universities and other big organizations. And he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a toy maker. And, and I could see this guy processing, like, um, what are you doing? <laughs> so I, it occurred to me that that was a really good question. There you go, why am I here? Uh, I'm here because Kim asked me, and it was really nice. And when he said, he said, please give a talk um, at the conference. And I said, but I don't know anything about anything relevant here. He said, say whatever you want. And I figured that since a lot of people here are open source people, I'd talk about why I'm not an open source developer. Now, one of the things I wanted to be really, really, really clear about, it's not that I have anything against open source, is a thing that I've noticed is even in technical things, there's a lot of style and a lot of personal preferences. And a lot of what's going on in the open source community, it's really funny because the other the closing keynote, um, I think we're going to end up talking about the same thing with the only difference is going to be they're 180 degrees apart that I'd like to talk about the sociology of not open source and a collection of projects that I've worked on and you know, just say a little bit. And, well, Kim wants me to tell stories. I'll try to tell some stories. Um, so I wanted to, th Kim, thank you. You know, this is, I, I wish I had a crown. Um, <laughs> what, the border, what I did end up saying to the border guard, he said, why are you going? And I said, well, I'm a software developer. I've lot of, done a lot of software development here. The people here are going to be a lot of software developers, and they've done a lot of software development. So there's a bit of a point of contact. And there's a way of talking about different kinds of, you know, different development methodologies and thinking. Um, so I wanted to, since Kim mentioned this, I was an undergrad at MIT, and I fell in with a bad crowd, the guys who were running the then Artificial Intelligence Lab. The Artificial Intelligence Lab, if you read, if you read Free as in Freedom, or um, I guess it was um, Stephen Levy's Hackers, both of them have chapters describing the thing at the time. A, a, a little bit younger than Richard Stallman, but I did overlap with him for several years. And um, I don't know how many of you have read Freedoms and Freedom. Um, I never got bothered by paper jams, so I didn't start a whole social movement. If you, you could probably do that. What, what I got out of that is as you could read in these books, it was an incredible, incredible place to be because people did things. And if you wanted, a, if you wanted something done, you just did it. And it required a lot of like, technical know-how, a lot of motivation, a lot of doing things. And if you just had a problem, you just plowed right through it. 
And what I got at the AI lab was, it wasn't really about the openness or sharing of the community. What I got out of it was really a sense of becoming a hacker. Now, as several of these books have pointed out, unfortunately, the word hacker was stolen from us. And um, it's OK. You know, it's a nice word, but if people wanted to use it to mean a criminal, then that's fine. I'll just find a different name myself and won't call myself a hacker. But back then, what a hacker was was somebody who did things with some level of technical sophistication that were fun and funny. And what we ended up doing is um, we made up a different word. We call uh, uh, Currently, my day job is I'm the president of the Playful Invention Company. So um, playful invention is a way of replacing hacking, is what we want to do is, you know, the corporate slogan which we just made up is simply we play and we invent. And, you know, what we're doing at the company is we're actually making little construction kits for kids. But back at the AI lab, there was, um, it was, um, by the way, I was going to, since we're talking about crazy hacks, there was the text editor then. How many of you, let's, to avoid, you know you can't talk about religion in public. How do people feel about Emacs versus VI? <laughs> um, um, so I, I was there during the era where Emacs first appeared. And it was really, really weird. Emacs's pre predecessor was this cryptic thing called Tico. And if people here aren't familiar with Tico, you should um, look at it as an exercise in line noise becoming command strings. You know, it's just, it was, to, and what would happen is people found that raw Tico was just too much for human beings, even of the hacker variety. So they started, it, it was an extensible language, so people started making macros in it. And there were the A macros, the B macros, the C macros. And the fifth version of it happened to be the E macros, which people named Emacs. And I think actually the naming of it is, um, there, there's some other story that they, tell, they told, but it really wasn't the fifth version, because there was also the big competition at the time was the question mark macros, and I don't know how we would have pronounced <laughs> that. But um, I was going to say, actually, just because when they were making these editors, after Emacs came up, a competitor came up, this is why I was asking how to count in German, called EIN, okay, where um, the, that was a recursive acronym for EIN is not Emacs, okay. The second competitor was called Zwei, okay, which was, Zwei was initially Emacs, okay. Um, I don't think there was a third one. I was waiting for the fourth one because I'd love to have an editor called Fear. <laughs> okay, because what do you do? You have a text document, you just scare it into being the right thing. <laughs> you know, so it um, didn't happen. But by the way, the other, these other editors um, were things on the list machines. And another thing that was big in the Free and Freedom story is, is how the whole list machine community spun out of, of that. So what I ended up doing, actually, is I didn't really spend that much time, is the way that there was, the AI lab was in a kind of boring building, and all of the computers and all of the real hackers were on the ninth floor. And the third floor was a kind of kinder, kinder friendlier place called the Logo Lab, where the Logo Lab was where they were doing some research into using computers for education for kids. And it was a very open place. Nobody cared if you just hung out and played with the computers. And this is, again, some of the other people in the room seemed to be nearly as old as me. So you could remember a time where if you wanted to play with a computer, you actually had to go to the place that had the computer, which is, you know. The Logo Lab was where they made a programming language for kids called Logo. And I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And at the Logo Lab, what did I like about it is, um, it was, like Kim was saying, lots of clever people hanging out. And you work on things, and you talk to them, and they talk to you back. You know, things would happen like, I see this guy who was putting a physics curriculum something together with the scissors and a sheet of paper, and he said he wants to deal with general relativity, okay? And I said, Okay, general relativity and paper. He just cut a little slice of it and put the pieces together, and he says, look, the 2D space is now curved. Okay, actually, this has nothing to do with this talk, but since you encouraged me to talk about anything, um, here's a wrong explanation of general relativity in th three minutes. Maybe give me three minutes. Um, imagine that, um, imagine the globe, and on the equator, 90 degrees apart from each other are two turtles. 
Okay? Both of them very carefully point due north. Okay? They said, we're both pointed due north, we're going to go in parallel. They start walking. As they're walking, when they're getting closer and closer to the North Pole, they're getting closer to each other. Do people visualize this? The turtle on the left, who will, for lack of a better name, called Newton, says, hey, we're getting closer to each other. There must be a force between us. Let's call it gravity. The turtle on the right, um, who, for lack of a better name, will call Einstein, say, no, no, no force. It's just that the world is curved. And the secret sauce of general relativity is understanding that you could replace invisible forces by curvature of the underlying space. So anyway, so I like the logo lab because you could actually get into conversations like that. And by the way, if you tell this story to a physicist, they'll tell you that it's completely wrong because it's not space that's curved, it's space time. And the actual equations are really tricky and hairy. But the central point that it's about curvature rather than about dynamics, I think is actually um, more or less correct. Um, so what happened was, by the time I was graduating, kind of synced up with me graduating. Um, there's actually, if I'm telling my life story, there was an in-between time. When I graduated, I ended up um, thinking I found the job at, but in fact realized there was a business deal that I was part of the deal, but nobody told me at, of building high-tech gadgets for blind people, which was really, really, it was fun and rewarding. Basically, what I had to do is, uh, Built, a, built an electronic system that converted type text into grade two braille. And this is not hard to do these days. It would probably be a five-line program if you had to do it now. But back then, we only had small computers. So I built a little microcontroller board, which did not have a 6809. It did not run fourth. But it had a 6800, and it was doing that. But after a year or two of that, my friends at the Logo Lab decided that it's a good research project. It's time to get it out in the world. Let's start a company. And in fact, we started a company called Logo Computer Systems, which a couple of years later hired Kim. And that's really where I started having experience with doing software projects and managing software projects and distributing software projects. And um, this is kind of, if I wanted to say why I'm not an open source developer, we didn't do it with an open, the sociology of it was totally not open source. And let me actually back up a bit, and since this is all about digressions. Um, so we're, we program computers, right? The thing that I've noticed is there's really two different kinds of objects that we're calling computers. And they're, in fact, very different one from the other. Um, one of the kinds of objects is like a Raspberry Pi or like an IBM 360. It's a system whose software system is vast, complex, powerful, subtle, tricky, and lots of interconnected pieces. The other, system, the other kind of computer is like a PDP-8, where basically you can understand everything about it, absolutely everything, like the Arduino. It's, it's crazy, because if you're a modern programmer, it's hard to believe that you can, get a, you can get a thing that is a computer. You can read the documentation of it, and the documentation is 100% complete and 100% true. Um, when we were making our first versions of Logo, it was for the Apple II computer. With the Apple II computer, we had documentation that was 100% complete and 100% true, and we knew there were going to be hundreds of thousands of clones of this object all over the planet. So we were able to program without any dependencies on anything. It was basically us versus, you know, we did this in assembly language in those days. And by the way, what Kim was saying is it, uh, us, uh, I don't know, I don't think it was me. We realized early on that actually typing code in on an Apple II to program for an Apple II would drive us crazy. So what we ended up doing is we were the first commercial customers of Lisp machines is we bought a few Lisp machines, and we were using the Lisp machines just to write 6502 assemblers and downloaders and debuggers. So we were basically very early on doing a, a host client thing, um, getting this code there. So what happened was um, we, got, we got the logo done, and for better or for worse, it was a big success which actually propelled us into being a real company. And after we did the Apple version, um, we started going around the world and finding other customers, a lot of them in Japan that had versions. We, we did a version of Logo for the Atari. 
okay, which, um, since this is more business history than anything else, the Atari company, I don't know if anybody remembers this, they had a very, very interesting arc as a company. They went from zero to a billion in sales in about 18 months. It took them less time than that to get back down to zero. <laughs> okay, that um, they were the flash in the pan of all flashes in the pan. And um, one way that, um, here, it's, it's, back then I used to play not understanding things like business. If you play the like jester, you can ask any sort of bad question. I, I asked them very early on, this is before everybody knew this, do you actually make money when you sell a computer? And they said, no, that's actually a very astute question. We lose money on every computer, but we're making the money back on software. Okay, so it was a very, very early admission of you know, the razor and blade model being true. And that actually turned out to be very funny because the marketing guy that I was traveling with at one point said, you know, if you get logo, um, your sales of computers will increase. And the guy said, with only a slight smile, we can't afford an increase in computer sales. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why did these guys go back to zero? We made a really fun version of Logo for the Atari 800, um, which was very, very interesting in that the Atari 800 had a 16K cartridge and 16K of RAM. So in a 32K environment, we made a full-fledged, garbage-collected programming language. And Atari um, did us a um, favor that was not a favor. They gave us the biggest order we could imagine times two. Okay, they basically bought us enough logo cartridges for the install base times two, because that's what they expected the Christmas growth to be. By the time the Christmas season rolled around, we had the check in the bank, and nobody was buying their computers, and they were history. But you know, that's a bit of a, a, a bit of a different story. Um, by the way. Um, Writing an interpreted language in a 16K, I noticed that now that we're, because of a Moore's law, we've lost sight about how big big is and how small small is. And um, I, I thought maybe we just need new terminology because people out there typically think in gig. And when we did, the, I worked with the Lego company a little bit on their newest Mindstorms brick, which runs Linux. Okay, but it runs Linux in a 16 meg environment. Okay, and nobody can understand that 16 meg is a zero. I said, why don't we just call it 16 milli gig? <laughs> okay, so in the Atari case, we were doing things in 16 micro gig, <laughs> right? And um, it's funny because um, the thing that I was making about the decision between two kinds of computers is there's the big guys and the little guys. In the big guys, it makes sense to think in gig, in the small guys, it makes sense to think in K. And most of the work that I've done over the years has been for small projects for small computers. Now, um, I booted up my computer, so I probably should do some demos of some kind. Um, this is, this may be a little bit out of order, but what I wanted to talk about a little bit, well, actually, why don't I do this first? Um, since we're talking about logo, um, I don't know if other people are like this. I've kind of got the day job, which is a lot of fun, but despite the day job being a lot of fun, I'm always working on these hobby projects, and I, you know, this may be the only crowd where actually writing code as a hobby isn't considered to be like sort of a cost for being certifiable. But um, what, what, what this is, is this is turtle art, which is actually, um, on my favorites list of current hobby. What it is is it's a drag and drop kind of logo-like language where if I pull out a forward block and I double click on it, the turtle goes forward. If I pull on a right block, how many people here have programmed with logo and turtle at some point in their careers? Okay, that's actually a fair number. So this, this may not be. Here, you could do this and um, you can pull out a repeat block and that makes a square. Um, what's programming really? It's about controlling repetition and naming. We can call this square. And I should spell it right for full. So we can clean and do this again. And we could then pull out a repeat block. Square. Right. 
so it, you, you could see that you can <coughs> fairly quickly build up interesting things. Now, the thing about it is this in and of itself is a little bit too little to be interesting. What we did, if I'm hoping this internet link is working. Um, Artemis, who's sitting over there, tried to convince me that when we made this, actually, it's a bit of a funny story as to why we made this thing. Um, in our day job, we were making the Pico Cricket Robotics Kit, which had this user interface. And I don't know if you make uh, objects that you're going to be shipping to kids, there's an incredibly intense approval process that you have to go through. So we basically had to wait a year while we were getting all sorts of safety regulations through. During that year, we kind of decided that maybe we should use our, our UI, this block space UI, and just bring back the old time logo turtle. And when we first did it, um, we did it for fun, and we didn't really know what we had. Because um, we actually, this is slow, so I'll talk while it's slow loading, is the turtle art thing could have been one, th one of three things. It could have been a kid's introduction to programming. It could have been an introduction to math, or it could have been art. Um, after Artemis saw it, she kind of became instantly convinced that it should be about the art of it. So we then spent the intervening several years making images. I don't know. Does some AV person have a guess as to why it's blinking? Maybe not. No idea. Um, what we ended up doing is spending hours and hours and hours <coughs> making images that we kind of like. And we were doing this a little bit over breakfast and then having play fights with people with art backgrounds about whether or not this is really art and if it is, what kind it resembles, what kind of stylistic things there are. But so this is where Logo came from. And actually, um, since this talk is about why I'm not an open source developer, I'll get back to the story of turtle art and, and open source. But the other hobby thing that I wanted to show you, because it's rare that I get an invitation to do whatever I want to a geek audience, and I like geeking out occasionally. Okay, what this is, um, this is the a emulation of the very first game, graphical game written on a computer. Okay, and again, I was saying this last night at some point. I'm choosing my words carefully, okay, because there had been prior games written on computers and there had been prior graphical games written on hard, on hard electronics. But what this is, is this is Space War written for the PDP-1. Now, how did this come to be? One day, um, in Boston, they used to have a computer museum. It lasted about 15 years. I don't know if anybody saw the Boston Computer Museum when it was there. We were friends of the museum, and we got invited to their opening of a new exhibit. And at that new exhibit, they had, a, they had parts from the MIT Whirlwind computer, which was one of the first computers in the US. And um, it had the old time, like you see in the movies, front panel with flashing lights. And I was there, like, sipping white wine, having, like, polite conversation like you're supposed to do at events like that. And the guy who was standing next to it put the exhibit together. And I said, what program is it running? Right? And the guy said, it's not running a program. It's just got some oscillators blinking the lights. And I was outraged. You know, <laughs> you clearly could make a whirlwind emulator to properly flash the lights. OK, so what this did is this sort of set me on the course to bring back old bits of computer software through emulation. Now, while I'm telling the story, since um, somebody should be screaming, where's the source? I, you know, um, let me actually hear if it demos sources. Actually, no, what I need to do is here I go back and document tools view source. And here is. Okay, what this is, is this is the boring part. This is the 300 lines of code that is the PDP-1. Okay, and in fact, the fact that you can have a PDP-1 and 300 lines of code, and what this is, is um, Okay, this is loading slowly, and it's kind of boring. 
What's about to come up, I'm going to tell you what it is just because it's going to be boring when you see it. It's a list of 4,000 numbers when you finally see it. What are those 4,000 numbers? That was what was in the memory of the PDP-1 when it was running Space War. How did we get those 4,000 numbers? Um, I remembered somebody telling me that they had the source tape for the PDP-1 Space War at the Computer Museum. So I then ended up spending more time than I should admit uh, I figured, hey, we got the paper tape, we could, we could build a PDP-1, why don't we just run Space War again? Problem, we're in 1995, there is no paper tape reader to be seen anywhere on the planet. And what we ended up doing is, we kept, um, we couldn't deal with it, because whenever we nearly had, it was answer, somebody would suggest something really great that we couldn't, like somebody said, why don't you just run it by a video camera and image process it? Great idea, we didn't do that. Somebody else said, why don't you build a mechanism out of Lego and use some simple light sensors? Other good idea, we didn't do it. What we did instead is, is I sent email to a friend, my friend who was one of the people running the museum, explaining the dilemma. She said, well, I'll give you the name of, a per, of the person who actually was one of the authors of this original work. So I called the guy, this is back in the day, and it's funny though, because when we're doing these computer recrea um, recreation projects, most people don't believe it, and they think, the guy basically said, you know, you're the seventh person who's asked me, the first six have wasted my time. Why should I believe that you actually are worth me talking to you? I sent him a URL that had the PDP-1 Lisp running on the PDP-1, and he played with the original Lisp, and then he was a believer. So then we got together. Um, um, so we got together, and he brought a 15-page listing that we figured we can type in again. And I can actually see if I can get the listing, if, but this network isn't being happy. Um, actually, and I'm not gonna try to get the listing. The, the, we ended up, there were three of us in the project, we divided the listing into three pieces, each of us typed in our piece, we were done. Um, the thing is, is one of the places where I'm a self-admitted idiot is there was a historical moment that I didn't record. The guy who um, had the listing from Space War showed up, and one of the three people on the team is a good friend of mine named Vadim Gerasimov, okay? Um, people probably don't know that name, but if we're old enough, you could remember when Tetris hit, hit North America, there was a rumor that Tetris was written by a 16-year-old Russian. Okay, Vadim was the 16-year-old Russian. So here I was with the guy, the 16-year-old Russian who wrote Tetris and one of the authors of the very first game. And we didn't record it. What happened was Vadim ran off to the photocopier to make copies of the listing to which Sh Shagret said, oh, I said, you know, Vadim wrote Tetris. And he said, oh, Tetris, that's my favorite game. And I thought that, that was an interesting comment from one of the pioneers of, of all of these games. By the way, um, when doing this kind of crazy work, it's kind of a reverse debugging because you have a working program, but you don't necessarily have a working computer. And what happens is um, we ended up doing a lot of this in kind of like a textual way before actually getting the graphics together. And it's hours and hours and hours of reading octal numbers, by octal numbers, because uh, old people could only deal with eight at a time rather than 16. You know, the next generation moved to hex, but that's, in that generation, it was octal numbers. And at some point, some really meaningful things appears out of the goop, like that spaceship. And when I first saw that spaceship, it was like, um, I, I don't know how to describe the feeling, the voice of a ghost. I'd never seen that before. And that spaceship had been sitting dormant in, I don't know where, if there's any philosophers in the room, they can actually say where the spaceship was in the intervening 35 years. And then it came back in its full glory. Um, the story that I like telling about this thing having gone to sleep and come back again is the first work we did for the PDB-1 was the LISP that I mentioned. And um, when I first got to MIT as an undergrad, that PDP-1 was about to be decommissioned and it was available for any undergrad to sign up and just do some, you know, just use. I had occasionally signed up and I used the Lisp. Then the machine got decommissioned. I may have been the last user to have used the Lisp before it went to hibernation. And then the first user to use it again when it came back, which again, I'm not even sure what to make of it, but at the time that it happened is when we were first doing this Lisp and out of the squall of octal numbers, I got an error message about a badly typed symbol. It was just like, 
<laughs> you know, this is like from a different planet. So anyway, when we were doing the computer recreation ones, we actually did a collection of them. This is me and my older brother. And um, what happened is we, we only published some of these because we decided that if we want people to be giving us source code, we have to be pretty vigilant about not breaking the copyrights. That we've, Space War is on the web. You just need to Google for it and you can play it. And we put it there because it's got, um, okay, we get mail from the license that says it, it just has some license saying, um, do what you want with it. We got mail saying that's not a valid open source license. And I'm saying, hey guy, this, this wording was written before you were born in the 60s. And you're criticizing the fact that they didn't guess what 25 years later would be a valid open source license. So anyway, we published Space War. The other works that we did is we did APL 360. I heard people here mention that they had heard of APL. Um, APL 360 is just like the, the, one of the world's nuttiest languages that everybody should study because it has a collection of extremely good ideas that have gone missing. Um, we, the most amazing one that we did actually was Smalltalk 72 from 1975, which was a project done at Xerox Park, totally under NDA. Um, nobody had seen it, even our close friends <laughs> at the Media Lab hadn't really seen it because, you know, Alan wasn't telling and, you know, only people who had actually physically visited the place had seen it. And when we ran it, it really looked like a dumb object-oriented extension to the logo of the day. <clears throat> when I talked to Alan, I said, what is this thing? He said, oh, we visited Seymour. Um, we wanted to invent object-oriented programming, so we figured we'd start with Logo. So, in fact, the thing that was a bit crazy, and I think I said this to some of you yesterday, is when that one first came up, it said, welcome to Smalltalk, um, August 1975, in black letters on a white background with proportional font. And my first reaction was, wait a minute, a proportional font in black on white in 1975. That's approximately about eight years too early, okay? Which may mean that this may have been the first thing that did that. The user interface in that one was, um, if you're interested in the history of things, it was a transitional form. It was about halfway to the modern UI. They'd invented click, but they hadn't yet invented drag. Okay, the thing that they got wrong on the UI, actually wrong because they were inventing this as they went along, a subtle thing is command lines have a verb noun word order where a graphical UI has a noun verb word order. They hadn't yet done the switch, so it was still click a verb from the menu, click a noun to, for it to act on, and it was all very clunky. And the comments in the source code were terrific. Like, you know, there was one place where we found the comments saying, this is junk, we have to, re we have to rewrite this code when we understand what objects really are. <laughs> and by the way, somebody wants um, an Alan Kay comment for, about C++ is he said, when I invented object-oriented programming, I did not mean this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what this is, and um, what this is, is, um, Okay, we have to, the whole thing, you need a bit of the history to, let me. So a friend of mine knew that uh, my brother and I were into computer simulations, and what he, he did, I don't know what, why he got into his head. This was about five, six years back. He thought that for the 35th anniversary of the Intel 4004, what he wanted to do is he wanted to make a scale model of the Intel 4004. Now, if you're making scale model trains, you make them smaller. If you're making scale model chips, you make them bigger. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to make a that big, um, transistor accurate model of the 4004. So um, he went to Intel, asked for funding, and asked for the schematics. And amazingly returned with three sheets of paper, which were the schematics for the 4004. Um, <clears throat> when my brother Barry and I, when Barry and I got these sheets of paper, we said, wow, we've got the schematics for the first microcontroller. I wrote a very simple transistor emulator. And um, we used Dia, actually. We spent a boring week entering the, the net list in Dia. And we're running 4004 code by doing the transistor model. Um, this actually, this was on the web in a minor way. And I get 
an email from somebody saying something very cagey about a year later, saying, I saw your 4004 work. It was really good. I have another chip that you might be interested in. And he wasn't telling, OK? Turns out, this guy, uh, if you think I'm in that case, OK, what, what, what he did for his jollies is he pried the lids off old chips and then carefully photographed it with a microscope and then wrote some stitching software to put the photographs back together and then wrote some custom software to figure out how to take these photographs and relayer them into their original layers. So he basically gave us a net list of the 6502. OK, what, th what you're seeing here actually is off on the side is it's kind of a hex listing of the code that's being run. OK, and um, there's actually no little man behind the curtains. OK, that code is running, and the only information that it's using to run the code is the geometry that you're seeing on the thing. OK, so this actually is the chip, and it's running as the chip. And if anybody's interested in this, there's a website called visual6502.org that has this and the story behind this and everything else around it. And it's funny because when um, I was making the claim about big computers and little computers, this isn't a little computer category. There's nothing behind the curtains because there's no curtains for anything to be behind. Okay. Um, this collection of lines and squares and little blotches was what was running Apple logo. No more. You know, that uh, below this is some transistor physics, but you could decide to not care about that because the logical model of what's happening. Um, somebody took our net list, didn't use actually our transistor simulator. He wrote his own transistor simulator and um, got the Commodore C64 bootstrap ROM to the point of basic running. Uh, okay. so. Um, from that, we have a strong sense that the net list is accurate. Now, um, I'm running out of time, which I suppose isn't surprising. Could I just, um, could I go over a little bit, Kim? Um, what I wanted to show as a next thing. Game of life. Um, how many people here played with the game of life at some point in their careers? This is a glider gun, okay? That um, what this is, is there's a square grid, and each square on the grid is following a very, very simple set of rules, where um, if a white square has exactly three or four neighbors, it stays white. If a black square has exactly three neighbors, it turns white. And nowhere in the rules is it talking about moving objects or structures that create moving objects. That's just something that happens. Um, I, I, when I was, the first computer program I wrote was we had access, it's a long story, and we don't have time, to a mainframe. And my brother and I actually wrote this, and we were using up reams of line printer paper, you know, figuring out about the life game. So I always had a fascination in this. And in the early days of logo computer systems, we wanted to do something to, uh, we wanted something to go viral 30 years before the notion of going viral was the notion. And the idea that I had was, why don't we make up a math puzzle that, um, I should say, in England at that point in history, some, somebody had written a children's book. That the children's book was a treasure hunt that had clues where to find a golden rabbit. And the author had actually um, hidden a golden rabbit worth about $150,000 somewhere. So everybody bought the book. And I figured, why don't we have a math contest that has these properties? We'll say, we'll give everybody the game of life. If you could find the starting position that lasts the longest before going stable, we'll give you $100,000. Okay, so we never did the contest, but it did cost me to go and visit some of the people who were important people in the cellular automata game. Most notably, through this, I got to meet Steve Wolfram when he was still the arrogant physicist and hadn't yet become the incomprehensible entrepreneur. But, um, but it got me interested in cellular automata. And the thing that, um, what I wanted to do is, if you've read about the game of life, you probably have read that it's been shown to be computationally universal. Well, what does computationally universal mean? It means you can make a computer out of it. I looked at this and said, like, how could you have meaning to the words, make a computer out of this? 
The answer is, as you can imagine that these gliders are like bits moving around in a serial bit stream. The thing is, is to turn into a computer, you'd need a screen about 50,000 times bigger in each of the two dimensions, and my Apple II wasn't going to do that. So if you can't win, then you, you know, the basic is when you hit a roadblock, the usual technique is to cheat. So what I did is I figured I'm going to make a different set of rules that are fairly easy. And I tried the simplest rules that I could imagine. Um, if a black cell has two white neighbors, it turns white. If all white cells go black. What I found much to my surprise is those simple rules did a glider dance. Okay? And this was another discovery that um, uh, my wife at the time was joking as I did this one afternoon and then spent the next three years giving talk conference talks about it, which was largely true. But um, the thing is, is these gliders get out of control. But what you can do to get to keep them in control is I cheated even further. I decided that I could have permanent dead cells and permanent live cells. And um, that just makes the thing turn the corner. And once you have a thing that can turn the corner, you could make something that starts having a controlled stream of gliders. OK, and you can actually see that the ad from a controlled stream of gliders, you can build logic gates where, let me actually, um, this is, the thing on the left is an AND gate. You'll notice nothing's coming in, so nothing's going out. One comes in by itself, it misses. Two come in together, it manages to produce something as an output. Now, what I then did, and since I'm going over it, and I wanted to leave some time for questions, I'm going to kind of cut this short and say, I invented an even more tight set of rules that ended up being called Wire World. Uh, um, the, um, this one, I had a bad luck in naming these things, because these things got popularized by people other than me, usually under different names. I ended up with two cellular automata rules that were sufficiently well known that they have Wikipedia pages for themselves. One of them is called Brian's Brain, which um, I wish I, you know, I, some, I saw a talk the other day saying that when something ends up being named after you by somebody else, it's okay to use its name, no matter how immodest that seems. I called it Mutants, which was a dumber name. But um, I showed it this to these guys. And this one, this one's just pretty. It doesn't do anything profound. For some reason, I found five different introduction to Java text that has this sort of problem in chapter four. That writing a Java, Brian's brain in Java is a, prob, is, is a popular intro thing. Um, what I wanted to get to was there's a second um, set of rules called the wire world rules. Um, I actually didn't. You, this is instead of gliders, there are things going on lines. And the photo that I just had up on my computer when I was first starting, I didn't make this. Um, and I don't even know if I wished I had made this. But some guy who is totally needs something to do in his life it, it took the wire world rules and made a stored program computer. Okay, that actually is what it takes to make an entire stored program computer. And the positions of the little white cells there is the program to calculate prime numbers. Uh, okay, and look this up on the web. There's actually a live version of it that I couldn't find that um, originally the running version was in Java and somehow Java security has been shut down so I can't run it anymore and there's a flash version somewhere else too you could find it. But um, w once again, this like the 6502 is if you're thinking about what is the minimum thing it takes to actually run code and to do programs, it's something of this scale. A few thousand elements, not a few million or billion elements. Um, so I don't know. I did want to leave time for some questions and comments. I wonder if there's anything else that. Um, I Maybe I'll go through this quickly. Since I, this always about development styles and open source development, um, one of the things that for me, I really like programming. Okay, um, Because I really like programming, the idea of pulling in a library is why should the other guy have had the fun? <laughs> right, that I'm constantly reinventing wheels. And what I find is that for a lot of tasks, not all, but for 80% of the tasks that people pull in libraries, um, you end up pulling in um, 
40% code, more, the more code than you need, and adding 20% to filter it to the case that you want. Right, where instead, if you just started and redid the thing, you could make something half as big or less. That um, a main thing, and why are these libraries often so big? There was a few cases where the reasons that these things grew so big and so bloated is they're written for big computers. They're not written for my computer. They're written for my computer, an IBM 390, uh, you know, an obsolete, I don't know what, Fujitsu. And you know, there's a make file that knows how to build this thing for every computer present and past, existing or fantasy. And if, in fact, you just needed the code that you're going to be running yourself, it's usually a tiny fraction of that. Now, why does it matter? Computers are big enough. The codes, code bloat really doesn't change anything. Um, it's, again, the stylistic thing that I refer to. At the real, I, I'm in my comfort zone if I fully understand every single thing in the system that I'm using. If there's a huge amount of bloat, it's complexity bloat. It makes the understanding process that much harder. Because when I've looked at a lot of open source things, I, I have a real hard time navigating through it. Because there tends to be um, make files that are made by programs that make make files that then can do a config to config this to config that. So at the end of the day, you say what code is running. You have to go to a debugger and step through it because you're never going to get it from the source because it's too conditional in too many ways. So the first point is um, I'm not afraid of and suggesting other people don't be afraid of reinventing wheels. A second thing that um, whatever the development style is, is a friend of mine actually um, use the phrase tightening the loop each time through the development cycle from an edit change to a running change. Um, I'm happiest if it doesn't exceed four or five seconds it, because um, I sort of program by debugging, which is really bad form. It's against best practices, and I understand that. But um, what, what I find is that what... Um, for me, the typical challenge in programming is not writing algorithms. It's instead understanding the environment that I'm in. And the process of understanding the environment that you're in, to me, the only way of doing it is by experimenting. So it's very, very, very important to be able to have a development loop where you're going through the loop really, really quickly. Um, oh, another thing is um, it could just be because I spent my whole career doing logo. For me, the biggest meta trick is write languages that if ever you're doing anything, there was an old joke when I first took my first AI course, is Lisp is the worst language for doing anything except one thing. That one thing is writing the language that's the best language for solving your problem. So the whole idea of application-specific languages, and this is the thing I actually don't understand about Unix culture. The um, command lines are everybody made up their own methodology. When it was the Lisp machines, whenever you needed to do anything, you would type a Lisp expression. And up and down, left and right, across the system, along all dimensions, there was a systematic way of doing something that's kind of like a shell script. If I want to write a program six times with seven different parameters, clear cut, it's in that language. So what I've been doing in practice is I've got the shell of a logo that's written in Java. Yeah, why Java? I don't like Java. It's, um, Java actually did kind of deliver the right ones run anywhere promise. Um, not very well, but better than anybody else. And make versions of that that have specific extensions for any problem domain that I'm working on. Um, and anyway, maybe I should wrap up and see if there's any comments or criticisms or questions. Yes. Since you've seen kind of like the growth since the beginning of all of this stuff, what's the latest thing like today that gets you excited? That today. Oh yeah, but what was the second? You, half? Since you've been around, yes. like since the core of it. Yes. What today, you know, in new technology or new languages, gets you excited now? Um, actually, I don't know if it's getting me excited because one of the things is for most of my career it was like. Um, Seymour Papert wrote this book called Mindstorms that was about the intersection of technology and education. And I think what we've been trying to do is figure out how to adapt the ideas and that to the new technologies of the day. So if it's okay, I'd like to rephrase the question of what are the new technologies of the day that are important? Clearly, 
Um, used to be one keyboard, one screen, one person, one program. You know, that's totally cratered, right? Programs are here, there, everywhere. People are interconnected, machines are interconnected. Um, you have something, it's gonna be on some amorphous collection of devices serving some amorphous community. Right, so the fact that, that there's global interconnectivity is really important. Oh, that's the fuel that keeps you guys going, right? Um, the fact that things can now be cloud-based is, is really important. Um, Moore's Law actually really helped us. The fact that that laptop has more computing power than was available in the United States the year I hired Kim, right, has got to be significant somehow. You know, that we really, you know, there, there's basically infinite computational power now. And, you know, figuring out what to best do with that, I think, is a very good challenge. So over the last, over the last day or so, we've been telling you more about Plone and how we do things in the community. You said you had some pretty incendiary thoughts. Do you want to share them? Um, sure, if you all promise not to kill me. Um, <laughs> I would spend a lot of time seriously considering the centralization versus the centralization of governance issue. That um, if you want to be doing things that have a long-term coherence, it requires a place for that coherence to live, and that's usually in the heads of a few key inner players. And I know it sounds very good to democratize out everything, um, I don't think you could democratize out design, and I don't think you could democratize out strategy. And um, this is, um, it's a tricky issue, because you could distribute out development, for, and for certain problems, distributing out <laughs> development is really a good idea. Um, the thing about it, and <clears throat> the story that I said I'd tell and didn't, is when we did Turtle Art, the main thing in the design of Turtle Art was religiously deciding what not to include. Right, that basically, Ed, it was almost a joke in that um, there's no square root in it, okay? Is it because I forgot the square root exists and I actually remembered the square root existed because I needed it to implement the turtle? We really wanted this to be an art thing for younger kids. And if you include the square root, um, it will almost instantly become a tool for teachers to demonstrate Pythagoras. Okay, what happened? We, um, I wanted to learn Python. The Exo computer came out. I ported Turtle Art to Python. I gave it to the Exo. In order to get it installed on the Exo, I needed to give an open source license. I pasted an MIT license on it. Nine months passed, square root appeared. And suddenly, the kids in Peru were using turtle art to see a demonstration of the Pythagorean theorem. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that wasn't our project. That was a different project. And that project turned into a full-fledged, highly powerful programming language that, um, in our minds and to our aesthetic, lost the early elegant simplicity. But you were asking about the Plone community. I don't know that I know enough to have incendiary comments that have a high probability of being true. The, the, the main thing is, is um, whenever we've worked on anything, it's an important question to figure, um, to try and find a sustainability model that has the minimum amount of external dependencies. Right, that you really want, if you have a project that you want to go on, you have to think hard about what it'll take to make it go on. And to the extent that it's self-sufficient, the more self-sufficient it is, the better it is. Do you want to, there's a, um, you had a, a, an argument with Richard Stallman? Oh, do you want me to tell that I had an argument with Richard Stallman? It says, um, uh, um, you know, it, 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 I, I, he's, um, I know him. I don't think he remembers me. I was a kid when he was a staff member, so he was definitely a presence during the years that I was at the lab. You know, I, I spent a fair bit of time with him in various different contexts, never worked with him on anything. One day, bef um, at the very, very early days of the um, FSF, I was visiting and saw him in the, you know, in the corridors and talked to him. And um, he asked what I was doing, and I said, 
um, we've got this company, Logo Computer Systems, and we're making educational software. And we have a happy customer base of a quarter of the schools in North America, slightly higher percentage in Canada. And he said, oh, is it proprietary? I said, yeah. And he said, why is it proprietary? Right. And I said, um, there's a group of us that want to be able to continue funding our development off into the future. And if it weren't proprietary, tomorrow Microsoft would pick it up and start shipping it. Okay, so we wanted to be pr proprietary, not to protect um, copyright protecting us little developers from the big developers. Because from the perspective of the schools, they didn't really care. Because if you want to be really incendiary, you could say free is less expensive than not free. Uh, you can figure out how this works for what you're doing. For what we were doing, if somebody was really going to do a serious job of getting logo into schools, um, it would have taken... Um, for every X in software costs, there was 10X in hardware costs and 100X in staff development costs. That there was no such thing as a free deployment because proper staff development um, vastly swamps the cost of the software. And what we argue to ourselves at least is if we actually charge for the software, then we can pay graphic artists and documentation writers and people to go out to conferences and all of the other people. Programming, every, people love programming. You can get that done for free. That's not hard. There's a lot of other stuff that people don't love doing for free that are a necessary part, a necessary part of, a, of a, a project that you want, you want to get out to the world. So anyway, so this is what I said to Richard. And his reaction... Um, I don't know if you could, I, I was with my friend Mitchell Resnick from the Media Lab. Um, Mitchell is about six foot two and I'm glad because um, Richard's reaction to this was to scream as loud as he could, you are evil, you must die. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured, end of rational debate, I put my six foot friend you know, <laughs> strategically between uh, him and me and we quietly left. But it, 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 the thing is, is um, if you wanted me to say, I'll try to say um, careful incendiary things about that part of the movement. Um, making source code available, I think, is a very good thing. Okay. In fact, I showed you Turtle Art. We don't publish this. Okay. But Turtle Art, we ship it as a jar file. Inside of the jar file, um, it's primarily written in Logo. All of the logo code is, is, is in the jar file, and all of the Java implementing the logo for that logo code is in the jar file. So we're actually shipping not only the source, but the entire development chain okay, with the product. And OK with that. The thing is, and maybe this is being um, an unfair control freak, when I talk to my artist friends, they really don't like the idea of people remixing their work. Because their work is their identity. And it's not about being nasty or about limiting things. If you take the time to make creative work, um, you artists have a natural feeling of ownership over the creative part of that work. We kind of feel that way about our software designs. Actually, don't feel that way at all about plumbing. That, you know, the, all of this computer simulation stuff, we, you know, all of that we just MIT licensed and threw that into the pool. Stuff where anything where we spend time putting, placing pixels in the right places, we don't want to have forked just because we spent a lot of time play, putting the pixels in the right places. If, since you're asking me, okay, since you, Kim, when I was at breakfast, there was a story that I told that he said I should tell, and it didn't fit in the flow of any of this, so I'll do it anyway. Is what I was saying, and I'm going to be outrageous. The um, Linux community has not given a proper thank you to Bill Gates. Okay, the reasoning is the following, and I actually believe this to be true. We met with some early Microsoft people, and the guy asked me a very good question. Beginning of the 20th century, the car industry was forming. Um, who, um, between Ford and GM, who did better? And what I thought he was asking, Ford was the apple of the day. They were a bunch of counterculture weirdos run by a charismatic who knows what. And GM was like a bureaucracy business people, anti-competitive, nasty, tearing up you know, streetcar tracks. It was, you know, it was really... And, um, I said, it's complicated. It depends on what you're really trying to do. And he said, 
I said, I don't know who won. He said it was X song. <laughs> and what he said is the most viable long-term business strategy, and this is a phrase that I love because it sounds so incomprehensible, commoditize the compliment. If you're a car company, the thing that you want to do is make there be cheap oil. If you're an oil company, the thing that you want to do is make there be cars. In the 80s, if you were a software company, you wanted there to be cheap computers. If you were a hardware company, you wanted there to be cheap software. So Sun and Apollo and all of the workstation companies were pushing Unix as hard as they can. Cheap software to fuel their hardware business. Microsoft decided to be a, hardware company, a software company. And to be a software company, what they needed to do is they needed to cause there to be very cheap computers. By a collection of very good business deals, they convinced all of the major manufacturing companies on the planet to start making cheap hardware. So because Microsoft wanted to sell Office, we all have $600 laptops. Okay, the existence of cheap computers is because of the fact that Microsoft was commoditizing the complement, and it was the existence of cheap laptops that allowed Linux to take off. So anyway, um, I just like, it may be like him, hate him. Um, it was Microsoft and that particular strategy that led to the context that we're in now. Okay, outrageous enough? You should probably thank IBM for making a bad deal with Microsoft then. Um, uh, you know, that one's complicated, because <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I think that may actually, um, the details of what was going on, that may not have been that important. Okay, because um, Microsoft was trying to do this kind of thing with a lot of different efforts that weren't DOS-based, and they weren't really succeeding. You know, it's, and because the thing about IBM is, if you remember, the original PC came out with three operating systems, not just DOS. And only DOS managed to make it through. And IBM's a whole other story that I could go on for, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's again, it's a different talk for a different day. IBM was probably the most interesting tech company in history. You know, that people don't give them enough credit. You know, that like, uh, I, actually, people my age were, grew up being schooled to hate IBM in the way people who were younger grew up being schooled to hate Microsoft. And I think in both cases, um, from the looking backwards in history, there was a lot of good in amongst the evil. Okay. Other questions? <laughs>